In the 1990s, a series of bombings at abortion clinics and gay night spots across the South ended with a bomb exploding at the Summer Olympics in Atlanta. Today, we tell the story of the manhunt for the person responsible for those acts in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Hello, folks. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories, A History of Appalachia. Now, before we get into this tale, be sure to go down below and click that subscribe button if you've not done so already. Ding the bell next to it so you can get notified every time we put out a new story. And if you don't mind, give us a thumbs up, okay? Hey, Steve, uh, we were talking about this a little bit before we recorded. You were very close to going to the Olympics, but you kind of backed out. And then I had my wife, my, actually my sister-in-law and her husband and the kids were in Atlanta when this whole thing happened back in ni- 1996. Was that when it was? 1996, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we, we had come up through there, through Atlanta from Florida, mm-hmm. and had almost thought about stopping to see if we couldn't get some last-minute tickets and decided, yeah, there's no way we could do that. And then the next day, this thing happened. Yeah, and, and, you know, we were there for a little while that night trying to figure out, you know, was my wife's sister, was she okay? Were, were the kids okay? Was her husband okay? But, you know, they, they ended up being fine, but I think they were a little bit away from all the events that took place. But they said it was pandemonium there pretty much in Atlanta because, you know, this is the first time anything like this had ever happened, you know, except for, of course, you know, some of us that's old that remember Munich when uh, the um, Israeli team was taken hostage. Uh, but, you know, this was the first kind of event, especially in the United States, that happened at the Olympic Games. Yeah, very interesting story and a very interesting character that was responsible for it. We're going to tell you about him and the manhunt for him today. This week, we tell the story of one of the most notorious criminals to spring from Appalachia at the end of the 20th century. Eric Robert Rudolph. Rudolph was responsible for killing two and maiming 150 during his anti-abortion, anti-gay bombing spree across the South during the late 90s. Rudolph, also known as the Olympic Park Bomber, was a homegrown Appalachian terrorist who set off bombs at not only the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, but at abortion clinics in Georgia and Alabama. But, Rod, who was this guy? Well, Eric Rudolph was born September 19th, 1966, not very far from my birthday, to be honest with you, in Florida. After his father's death in 1981, Rudolph's mother moved the 15-year-old to Nantahala, North Carolina, in Macon County. While there, his mom indoctrinated him in the Christian Identity Movement, a white supremacist group also strongly opposed abortion. Now, according to the Anti-Defamation League, Christian identity is made up of people who, quote, believe that whites of European descent can be traced back to the, quote, unquote, lost tribes of Israel, end quote. Now, many consider Jews to be the satanic offspring of Eve and the serpent. That's the first time I've ever heard of anything like that. But while non-whites are mud peoples created before Adam and Eve, its violent, racist, and anti-Semitic beliefs are usually accompanied by extreme anti-government sentiments. Well, Mom was also a survivalist and taught her son survivalist skills, which eventually became a part of Eric Rudolph's story and the legend. In August 1987, Rudolph joined the Army, but it didn't last long. By January 1989, he was kicked out for smoking pot while stationed with the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Returning home, he took up carpentry with his brother, and it seemed that, well, that would be the end of the story. Until 1996. That year, Atlanta, Georgia was chosen to host the Olympic Games, and Nothing was spared to make the Summer Games a showpiece for the world. It was the centennial of the Olympics, and Atlanta constructed an Olympic park in which to hold the Games and the hundreds of thousands of visitors that those Games would attract. And that's where Eric Rudolph decided to enter history in a horrible way. On July 27, 1996, a blast consisting of three pipe bombs contained in an Army backpack, went off at the Centennial Olympic Park, killing a visitor who'd come to watch the American basketball team compete, Alice Hawthorne. A Turkish cameraman was there, covering the basketball game, and he rushed to Miss Hawthorne's aid. 
But in all the excitement, he died of a sudden heart attack. That blast, which intentionally threw out a tremendous amount of shrapnel, wounded 111 other spectators. Well, initially, attention was focused on a security guard at the scene as the bomber. Richard Jewell saw the backpack, became suspicious, and began clearing people out of the area, saving countless lives. Unfortunately, though, the news media began to speculate that maybe Jewell was responsible for this, desiring attention for being a hero, which brought an FBI investigation, which was eventually dropped. And as a side note, Mr. Jewell later sued NBC News and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for libel, demanding an apology and settling with both outlets. Now, Eric Rudolph had set the bomb in Atlanta, hoping to force the cancellation of the Olympics, or to at least financially destroy the Games, but that didn't happen. His problem with the Games was that it, in Rudolph's opinion, that they not only promoted global socialism, which went against the ideas of nationalism, but more importantly to him, he wanted to embarrass the U.S. for its sanctioning of abortion. Well, that's not his only bombing. He set off nail bombs at abortion clinics in Sandy Spring, Georgia on January 16, 1997, and Birmingham, Alabama one year later to protest the performance of abortions there. The Birmingham blast killed police officer Robert Sanderson and injured nurse Emily Lyons. He also targeted the Other Side Lounge in Atlanta, a gay nightclub, with a bomb on February 21, 1997. Rudolph was identified as a suspect in the Atlanta bombing by the Department of Justice on Valentine's Day, 1998, and that's when the second part of this story begins. You see, immediately after being ID'd, Eric Rudolph took off into the Appalachian wilderness and stayed on the run for the next five years. A very popular T-shirt at this time in western North Carolina simply read, Run, Rudolph, run. The Christian identity movement was very supportive of Rudolph, praising him as a hero who ought to be emulated. And in probably the most bizarre part of a very strange case, Daniel Rudolph, Eric's brother, on March 7, 1998, videoed himself cutting off his own hand with a chop saw to, quote, send a message to the FBI and the media, end quote. Hardcore indeed. By the way, the uh, hand was later successfully reattached, in case you're wondering. Well, you know, I thought that was going to probably put an end to his carpentry business right there if he had his hand chopped off. But, yeah, like you said, it was later reattached. But all of this led to the FBI to list Eric Rudolph on its 10 most wanted list on May 5, 1998. Now, the Fed swooped into western North Carolina on a manhunt, and they came up with, you guessed it, nothing. Eric Rudolph seemingly vanished from the face of the earth. One of the few verified contacts with the fugitive happened not long after he disappeared. A local health food store owner was contacted by Eric Rudolph and asked to give some supplies, which was refused. Well, later, there was a break-in at the store. Food and supplies were taken and money was left, which was determined to be from Rudolph. Other than that, Sightings of Rudolph were like sightings of the Woodbooger or Bigfoot, few and far between, and a lot of them not to be believed. It's speculated that locals who sympathized with Eric Rudolph helped him evade federal authorities. Speculation that, to be honest, was probably true when you looked at his condition when he was caught. Which rod happened in a dumpster behind the Murphy, North Carolina Save-A-Lot food store in the early morning hours of May 31st, 2003. On that morning, a brand new Murphy police officer, Jeffrey Scott Postal, was on patrol when he noticed some unusual activity behind the Save-A-Lot. The officer approached what he thought was a homeless man. Well, yeah, I guess that would be true here. Uh, and he stepped into history himself. He found and arrested a clean-shaven man with a fresh haircut and neatly trimmed mustache who was dumpster diving. Other officers arrived on the scene, and at first Rudolph gave them a false name, but then later admitted that, yeah, they had Eric Rudolph in custody. Now, Rudolph was unarmed and very thin and apparently very hungry. The police brought him breakfast, which he wolfed down. Well, after being represented by two separate attorneys at federal court, 
Rudolph worked out a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. On April 8, 2005, the U.S. Justice Department announced that Rudolph had agreed to plead guilty in all of the bombings. Now, one of the conditions of the plea agreement was that Rudolph disclosed the hiding places of all the explosive materials that he had hidden in the mountains of western North Carolina. Well, the FBI went on a search and found 250 pounds of dynamite that he had hidden in the woods. The pleas were made in person in courts in Birmingham and Atlanta on April 13th. Rudolph also released a statement in which he explained his actions and rationalized them as a serving the cause of anti-abortion and anti-gay activism. He was officially sentenced July 18, 2005 to two consecutive life terms without parole for the 1998 murder of a police officer. He was sentenced for various bombings in Atlanta on August 22, 2005, receiving three consecutive life terms. On August 22, 2005, Rudolph was sent to the ADX Florence Supermax Federal Prison in Colorado, the home of other notable criminals such as the Unabomber, Zokar Sarnev, Terry Nichols, and Zacharias Masawi, who helped plan 9-11. Rudolph is inmate number 18282-058 within the U.S. federal prison system. And like other Supermax inmates, he spends 22 and a half hours per day in his 80-foot square concrete cell. Now, mm. let me uh, tell you one little neat thing that I noticed not too long ago. You know, we've done this story on our audio podcast right. back in the past, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And a listener of ours made a comment on the podcast, and I don't think I told you about this, but he was friends with this officer that found Rudolph. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, you know, this guy had a real big brush with fame, I guess, you know, or mm. secondhand, you know, knows somebody who knows somebody. Um, and there was some other stuff here I was wanting to let you know about, too. You know, we're talking about this dynamite. Yeah. Turns out that one of the caches of dynamite, what he'd do, he'd get like 20 sticks of dynamite and dig a hole and put them down in there. Mm -hmm. One of those caches was like right outside the main headquarters of the folks from the FBI and, and all that, that were looking for him, not more than 20 feet away. Now just imagine that he was able to get that close to them, dig a hole, put dynamite in it and sneak off. And they didn't know it. That doesn't say very much about the FBI, or at least at that point or that time and stuff. When you know you're supposed to be on top of all these things, wow, twenty feet. Yeah, I mean he wow. was right outside. I mean he could have blown the whole thing up if he'd wanted yeah, to. If he'd been pushed, or you know he'd had it on his mind, he could have just simply gone, dug up a little bit of it, found the fuse or whatever, done enough to put the wire in. He'd have detonated it. He'd just set him off. But gosh. I can't believe it. 20 feet and just under the nose of the FBI. That's unreal. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating story, and it I guess it was the culmination of the 90s because you had all that stuff going on in the 90s. You know, Timothy mm -hmm. McVeigh and then the stuff down at Waco, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some others as well. Some people were shot, and then you had this kind of finished out a really wild decade of right-wing terrorism in this country. Man, I'm telling you, you know, and you know who I feel so sorry for in the end. And I, I think back on this and I think we may have talked a little bit about this before we started recording was I feel bad for Richard Jewell. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had a chance really to watch Clint Eastwood did a movie about Richard Jewell and I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. But the story behind him it's it's almost like he was portrayed in some ways in the media as one of these southern good old boys that was wanting to be a cop but you know didn't quite cut it or didn't quite yeah. make it he had to be a security guard and even though he saved a lot of people's lives he still was blamed to some degree out of it and essentially ruined his life and he was able to rebound some but you know he died of natural causes i think he diabetic he uh, had heart problems and different things like that and i remember him he was a pretty big guy but this guy did all this stuff, and then yet Eric Rudolph was the one that, you know, walked away with it and, and did so for a number of years before he was finally caught. Yeah. 
And folks, that's the story of Eric Robert Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber. Another story that makes up the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Now, if you'd like to subscribe to our audio podcast, you can do so by going to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, iHeartRadio, Audible, or simply on your favorite podcast app. Till next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. So long. <laughs>